Well, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the first of our seminars for the uh, coming year. It's a great pleasure to meet uh, virtually like this. And of course, we have been discussing when we can meet face to face again, and so that we can continue a mixed uh, program. Uh, my name is David Shankland. I'm the, the chairman of our society. I uh, announcements actually, except to say good evening uh, to our members. And so we can move straight to the to the talk, uh, which as you would have seen from the blurb looks absolutely fascinating. It covers so many different topics, um, tobacco, the contraction of the Ottoman Empire, the emergence of the Republic, the founding of the Ishman Kassa, and then uh, the, um, the, the, the, the, the, the, the, the, the uh, establishment of the, of the Republic subsequently and the place of tobacco within it. So we really are very, very privileged to hear about such a fascinating Turkey's history this evening. And um, I think the simplest thing to do is to turn to our speaker and say, and say the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. Uh, just a second, let me put the, um, adjust it. Is it good now? Perfect. Okay. Well, uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for inviting me to this talk. I'm flattered to be invited and speak about my beloved grandfather. Uh, um, I'll be talking about Ibrahim Pasha Zadeh Hussein Hüsnü, which is a long name. Ibrahim Pasha Zadeh is, means that uh, his father is uh, from uh, Ibrahim Pasha was his father. But then uh, he became uh, Hussein Kavalada simply after the uh, uh, surname law in 1934. So I will call him uh, either uh, Hussein Bey or <laughs> my grandfather, because this is a very long name. Um, I'd like to tell you, take a few, few minutes of your time to tell you how I started on this journey uh, of, of discovering about my grandfather. Uh, I have, I had very few documents from the family and very few stories about the whole uh, family background. I don't know if it's a trait specific to, to our family, is it typical to a trait to other immigrants? You know, hush, hush. Uh, nothing is spoken. Uh, I guess memories hurt them. Uh, that's that's how I uh, my my uh, uh, I think that they don't want to go back to those memories. So I had very little. What I had was this picture. One of the pictures. I mean, I had a few pictures, but this picture. Uh, this is the grandfather's house on the hill, which I know that it's now on the hill, uh, which uh, was occupied by the Greek army in 1924. It says it's building of the army federation. So uh, it starts with this photograph. In, in, in 2018, uh, we planned a trip to go to, uh, to, to, to Kavala with my good friends, uh, David and Mariana, uh, Mariana and David Edgerly, who live in London, actually. I invited them, but I don't think they are here. <laughs> anyway, and uh, we, we uh, reserved a place at the Imaret Hotel, which I will, I will show you, because I don't know if you've been there, but I think it's a, uh, it's a wonderful hotel, and I would advise you <laughs> strongly to, to go and visit Imaret. This is a, a place, I don't know if you know it, but this is a place where uh, Mehmed Ali Kavala and Mehmed Ali Pasha uh, constructed. And this is to, to educate children and to feed the poor. It's a, it's a big complex, which uh, uh, round and then was, was renovated by, uh, by Anna Messerian. 
anyway, we stayed there and uh, we were talking and uh, we showed the, the, the picture to the waiter and he said, you know, it's just up on the hill. And the next day uh, we, we go up and this is the house in the, in, in, as, as it stayed today. But we couldn't enter because it was all locked up and it was unfortunately run down. Uh, first, it, it was used by the, by the military and then it was passed on to uh, uh, uh, ministry, used by the ministry and was locked up about three years or four years ago. Unfortunately, it's run down. Uh, so we couldn't enter. But what I got as a as a as a, as a bonus was the pomegranate, my wife from uh, from the from the tree overhanging the garden. Anyway, we go from there to the tobacco museum, which is a, a very nice museum in uh, in Kavala, uh, and uh, we go around, of course. It's a, it's really a place to be seen. And of course, nice uh, smell of tobacco. And then I'm looking for something about my grandfather. I mean, if I can find something. And suddenly I, I see him sitting over there. His photo in the Tobacco Museum of, of Kavala. So, of course, this is exciting. I mean, this, this picture, I have not seen uh, his picture. Then I, I, I saw this picture in the Istanbul Chamber of Commerce it's on, on, the, uh, on, the, on the board there. Anyway, my first trip was not all that productive. I had seen the house from the outside, uh, seen the photograph of my grandfather and got my, my problems. Anyway, one day I, I received a call from my good friend, Eileen McCarthy, uh, advised me about the conference about Kavala the Mehmed Ali Pasha at the Sabanji Museum. So I go there, Professor Heath Glory talks about the Pasha and was followed by a talk about the Imaret by Anna Musirian, who is uh, tobacco company Harris. And I think it's the only one left around there. And I've renovated the Imaret to make it into a wonderful luxurious hotel. I get there and listening to the story how it was reborn from the ashes impressed me. And after the talk of the, during the cocktails, uh, I met Anna and congratulated her. And I said, uh, you know, I'll be visiting Kavala uh, next May. And there I also I met my good friend, Mik Mikhail, who is <laughs> now one of the listeners. Anyway, I went uh, back to Kavala in May 19. And, uh, and there I had a chance through Anna to meet the Tobacco Museum founder and manager, uh, Yanis, and his friend, Michael Svetsamanolo. Here they are. Michael Saksamanolo, myself, and uh, Yanis Vizikas, who have uh, created this tobacco museum. He's very knowledgeable about uh, tobacco. Uh, they project about tobacco roads, which they shared with Osman Kavala before he was put to jail, uh, unfortunately. So it's, uh, it's at a, still at the standpoint. By the way, they are also actively supporting and lobbying activity for his release, but to no avail, unfortunately. Anyway, uh, we became good friends and through them, uh, I, I learned a lot about uh, my grandfather's activities in Kavala. Coming back, I went through the Ottoman archives, uh, the Istanbul Chamber of Commerce archives, newspaper archives and the Turkish parliament archives. So it's been a lot of work because as I said, I had very, very little to start with. But this got me excited and uh, now I'm uh, trying to gather 
and write a, a, a biography of his own life. Anyway, uh, my grandfather was talking about, uh, uh, sorry. Um, my grandfather was born in, in, in uh, Cerepiani, which today is called Iliokomi. Uh, but what I'll try to do is to put into a, a, a frame of the timeline and what was going around in the world around him when, at the time he lived. Uh, first, let me tell you about Macedonia, uh, which is where he was born and he, he, he, I mean, he, he started his business, his life here in, in Kavala area. But Macedonia is, is, a, is not a, a state or a, a, it's a, a ge geographical region surrounded by mountains uh, and, and lakes and is defined as such. So it's not a, it's not a state. Today it's uh, covered by, uh, by 52% and North Macedonia 38% and 10% Bulgaria. The Kavala is, is right, oh, sorry, right here at the, towards the Eastern age. And this is the Greek Macedonia, so we can see better here. The uh, Kavala is here, Tassos. Kavala was a settlement uh, that began in the seventh century BC. It was called Neopolis, and then was changed to Christopoli, and then uh, became Cavallo or Kavala. Probably the name Cavalla comes from uh, Cavallo in Italian. I mean, that's, that's, my, uh, that's my guess. Because the city was invaded by Alexander the Great, Rome, Byzantine, and then Ottomans finally in the 14th century until 1912. Another interesting thing about Macedonia, this region, is that it has taken a lot of uh, immigrants, even from uh, before the Ottomans, Turks would be coming from Tunisia due to, due to drought. Pechenex, Comans, August Turks. So when I ask myself, I don't know if my ancestors go through Anatolia or come directly from, uh, from, from, from Central Asia. Anyway, it was an, it's an important place, uh, city, uh, town because it has got a, a, a port. Uh, it's got a, a, a castle and a place surrounded by walls. And it's uh, it's it's on the uh, famous Via Ignatia, the Roman road from from Rome to, Ad, to from Adriatic to to Constantinople and Dardanelles. So it's. It, it, it sits on an important, uh, important uh, geographic location. Uh, this is the Balkans in 1878. And this is the Ottoman part of the Balkans. And this is Greece. Uh, Bulgaria is, is here. Now, things starts to, to to, to uh, go bad for the uh, for the Ottomans with the 77 78 Russian war where Russia conquered almost all of Macedonia and established the principality of uh, but which was not accepted by the neighboring states and the and, and the great powers so this was reversed and uh, part of the Macedonia that we're talking about was given back to the Ottomans. Of course, the Bulgarians were not happy with the outcome and started attacking Macedonian villages through irregulars called Komitajus. 
Hence, my grandfather used to tell me that he had been trained to carry a gun since he was seven years old, because there were all these attacks. The, uh, the, the IMRO, uh, that's the Internal Macedonian Revolution Organization by the Bulgarians. And, uh, and interestingly enough, the ARF, the Armenian Revolutionaries, were attacking Macedonia to form an independent Macedonia, which later became uh, uh, changed because of the, uh, uh, the uh, Ilinded uh, uprising in 1903, when it was crushed by the Ottomans. So Ibro went back and, uh, and the ARF went back to work for Bulgaria. So, because the Bulgarians always had a, a, a thing to, to, to come down to the Aegean. Anyway, all this turmoil was building up to the finale of the Ottomans in the region. <coughs> so, this was the environment that he was growing up. Anyway, coming back to my family, uh, my grandfather's grandfather which is the founder of the, uh, of the main business, is Haji Shakira, was born in Cerepliani. Was probably born in Cerepliani because this is the 1832 census, which I found in the Ottoman archives. Here it's noted uh, with a circle. He's three years old. It is the, uh, as far as I know, it's the first census that the Ottomans had done. Uh, by the way, it's only the men were counted, not the uh, <laughs> not the women. But uh, the Ottomans good were good at uh, counting the animals and uh, and the land registry because they were all subject to taxation. Anyway, there was another census in 1944, and uh, there he was recorded as 14 years old. Uh, I mean, this I take it as a proof that the family base was Cerepliani. He had three sons, Ibrahim, Omer, and Mehmet. Him, the eldest one, is my great-grandfather. During this time, the tobacco habits were changing over the world, and cigarettes were slowly replacing pipes in Europe, and local variety of what's called the Turmak, Turkish, Macedonian, Macedonian Basma, Katerini, and uh, Kabakulak, uh, were, were, uh, were the varieties which were sought after because of their aroma, good taste, colors, low nicotine, burning quality, uh, they were sought after by the cigarette factories in Europe and later by, by the U.S. Thus, the tobacco cultivation increased in Macedonia. Uh, this I talk about the second half of the 19th century. And the land behind the uh, mountains of Kavala, the drama stretch, we go back here. These are the mountains. I mean, this, this stretch here, is very suitable for uh, for growing for growing tobacco, and the family here expanded and bought four farms. You can see, uh, sorry, uh, four farms. One is Cerepiani. Uh, this one is Cerepiani. This is Badem Chiflik. Uh, there's one in Thoros here and uh, one in Korniste. There were four, four farms growing tobacco and, and breeding a lot of sheep. <laughs> this is the Basma tobacco leaf, famous. Uh, this is Badem Chiflik. I've not gone to the other places, but this is by them, I think is interesting because uh, when we went there with, uh, with Yanis, well, he showed me the warehouse, but did not know whether it belonged to uh, our family or not. 
<coughs> but then later, we found an article, uh, a letter by Elisa Rakis, who came from Pontus, was the first teacher of the primary school in, uh, that opened in the, in the tobacco shop. And he states, owner of Chiflikio, which is, means the farm, Chiflik, until the liberation fight of the Balkan Wars in 1912, 1913, was a base. A base is where the Ottoman army was, the, uh, I will come back to that later, but the Ottoman army was used as a base during the Balkan War. Haji uh, Shakirev and these had 17 houses in Kavala, climbing Thessaloniki Street, all evenly. I don't know about those, the two large buildings about the arches. Today's men's high school and division. After the liberation of Kavala in 1913, left for Constantinople. And the estates came to the rule of the Greek state. Of course, the men's school did not belong to the family. Uh, we'll see that later on. Okay. Now, I'm showing you this because the, the, the tobacco growing business was becoming very important uh, during the second half of the 19th century. And uh, the family took on to become traders uh, in the business of the Kavala in the early 19, 1890s. And my, my grandfather was very young in his teens and he got involved in the tobacco trading business at a very young age. He was also very knowledgeable in tobacco agriculture, which he also demonstrated when he settled in Turkey and became a leading figure in the tobacco sector. In, until 1864, the processing of tobacco uh, was done in the houses within the city walls on the Panagia Peninsula. Oh, you see the peninsula here in my background. <laughs> but uh, except, except, interesting, there was another speech about Fratelli Aretini. Uh, they were permitted to build a warehouse outside the walls. I mean, they were really a prerogative company. However, in 1864, the building code changed and they allowed the, the buildings to be built outside the walls and can be built higher than seven meters. That's when tobacco shops were started building in, in, the, uh, in the crescent shape uh, area of, of the harbor. These are all, all you see are, are, are, are tobacco warehouses. The exports of tobacco in 1911, just to give you an idea, was 12,000 tons and worth about two and a half million pounds sterling. Uh, there were 160 tobacco shops and 61 trading houses by 1913. So it was becoming a, a really an important business. The family. Uh, had 14, uh, built 14 tobacco shops and had acquired three plots of land by the sea on the harbor of Kavala. It is very close to the center. I've seen all those plots uh, to build tobacco shops. I mean, and these I was able to locate through the exchange relation requests by the family made to the, the, the Turkish state. Uh, there are, I mean, these, these seven tobacco shops, and there's another one, eight, eight of them are still standing, which were, I was able to locate through uh, the help of Yanis. These are the warehouses. That I mean, the, the, this you see from the uh, bird's eye view, and this is the uh, the, the front. I mean, these are massive uh, 
uh, massive warehouses. Uh, interestingly enough, this one on the left was bought by Michael Satsamano's father. So he had the key and we went inside. <laughs> so this is the, the uh, processing area, storing area and processing area of tobacco. Uh, this is another one. Uh, here left you see the exchange claim of property. This is how you they made their uh, their claims with photographs and explanation of the, the property. Evaluate them and, and give it to the state. And this is the building. This is from uh, Vizika's Yanis's book. There are two here, which one of them has become a, a, a residential place. Yes. See. It's interesting to note here, I mean, a side note that uh, I've been talking to versus Michael, that uh, it's interesting to see that all the important real estates where the exchange of population took place. Uh, the Greek settling in Kavala did not, not get they had in, in, in, in Asia Minor, their, uh, their corresponding value. I mean, all these major buildings were either taken by the military or by the uh, National Bank of Greece and then sold to um, companies or whatever. Uh, it's interesting because uh, Michael's father bought this, well, bought the, uh, the, the, the warehouse from an American company, which had bought it from the National Bank of Greece. Interesting. Well, uh, the, the family was uh, family was among the most powerful. I mean, this is according to uh, what Yanis has told me. That was among the most powerful and probably well, one of the wealthiest families in Kavala. Uh, there are documents about that. And they had a lot of real estate. And uh, my grandfather's father, Rain Pasha, was decorated as Rupi Miri Mirani. This one, by the decree of Sultan Abdulhamid, and became a Pasha. It's a civil Pasha, it's a civil uh, title. It's not a uh, military title, it's a uh, civil title given to important personalities in the region. Uh, it's exact translation is Bay Levy. I don't know what it's said in English, but uh, who represents the Sultan in the region and is responsible for, for communicating Sultan's demands and commands to the public and also has to take care of the needs of the army. This is Kamala today. And this is Kamala during 1910. This is this is the grandfather's house. And this here you see the, the, the school which is done by the, uh, was constructed uh, during the uh, CUP period. I don't know why they, they I mean, they, uh, they, they, they blocked the view. Uh, it is said that uh, Aji Shakir paid a lot of money so that he can buy the land, but they wouldn't.
Oops, sorry. This is the view of the from the top. If if you hadn't this house, this this school, the view would be uh, magnificent. This is uh, a house of uh, Amere Pandi, which is the uncle of my grandfather. And uh, again, this this one is the exchange declaration of the house. This is the house today, which is occupied by the military. It's called the General's House. It's just in front of the Mehmed Ali's house here, which is turned into a museum. The Mehmed's house is here. And this is the Imaret. So it's on the Panagi Island. Anyway, the booming uh, tobacco business in Kavala drew foreign companies. Uh, major European countries have their consulates. So here you have uh, consulates of I Italy and, and, and, and England in one, one building. And this is the Grand Club. Uh, you have the Ottoman Bank. You have lots of banks being uh, operating, including the Ottoman Bank schools and hospitals, the new fort building. So this small, uh, there, there are also hotels, restaurants, and uh, as we see here, uh, famous Grand Club. So it's becoming a, a small town or a big, big, big village, turning into a Western commercial city. This is, uh, well, it's difficult to read, but these are all the companies petitioning for uh, opening up a, a post office in the uh, Ayaini district. Now, the, the, the sector of two issues regarding tobacco sector. One was the first one, because the financial situation and difficulties of the Ottoman Empire, uh, to pay the debts, to her debts, the rights of collection of taxes of tobacco, what's called the Duyunu in Urumiye in 1881 for 10 years. Then in 1883, the right was transferred to Reggie Company for 30 years, which would act as a monopoly monopoly on tobacco business, control tobacco agriculture and trade, except the exports were free. But still, the regime had a big effect on the tobacco business. They had an army of controls to avoid uh, cultivation uh, and trade of tobacco without their knowledge. They were acting like states police and even harsher. The second one is that the transformation of people from farming to becoming factory workers brought a change in the social and political environment. So by this time, the city had grown to 20,000 people. These brought rising problems to religious interventions and not fulfilling their commitments towards growers, export traders, as well as treatment of tobacco workers. Low wages and long working hours of the workers led to the unofficial formation of Kavala Welfare Association of Tobacco Workers in 1901. And have organized serious strikes in 1905 and 1908. It was only in 1909, after the, the second constitutional period, it was allowed that the formation of the associations law, it was allowed uh, to become official. That is the Kavala Welfare Association of Tobacco Workers became official only after 1909. And this Tobacco Workers Union 1909, this is the one in 
old script, and this is the translation. And here you see my grandfather, elected as the as the honorary president of the union, along with Nikola Panayot Sardarov. It is highly probable that these two were organizing the workers into action of the union in 1901. My mother used to tell me that my grandfather had organized the workers to strike against his own family. And uh, Yanis was written a the book on the movement tells me that because the workers were generally an illiterate bunch, they would need a leader to get organized. And that these two could be behind the movements. I don't know. I mean, these are all suggestions. But, but this is a fact that he was elected as the um, uh, honorary president of the, of the workers. I mean, I know that my father, uh, my grandfather believed in uh, economic liberalism. He was an entrepreneur. Okay, he was a capitalist, but he was also a social democrat. He believed that capital and labor could prosper together. And he, he saw the damage the regime had done to the tobacco industry as a monopoly. Later in Turkey, he would spare the movement against the establishment of the Turkish monopoly. Now, because of all these problems, there were two uh, congresses, one, one congress in, in, in, in drama and the other one was in, uh, in, in Kavala. And in both of them, uh, my grandfather represented Kavala traders, traders and uh, was the chairperson in the, uh, in the Kavala this one or the second chairperson, let's say, because the first one was a, a member of parliament from, from drama. Uh, but he was he was there to, to lead the, the, the Congress. These were mainly to solve the problems with, with Reggie. There were a lot of problems, a lot of complaints. Uh, so a lot of uh, decisions were taken uh, in these two congresses. Okay. Now, uh, in, I have not verified it yet, but uh, it is mentioned in a research paper that he was a board member of the CUP, that's the Committee of Union and Progress. Uh, in Kavala, and also was a mayor or a deputy meet mayor of Kavala in 1908. I have not, I mean, this was just uh, uh, mentioned somewhere, but it's not verified. Anyway, in 1912, Greece, Bulgaria, and Serbia made a coalition to capture Macedonia and end Ottoman rule. After the first Balkan, Balkan Balkan Wars, the Bulgarians invaded Kavala during November 1912. And it is noted in the reports of Konstantin Bulgarides that on November 9th, the irregulars along were sent before the regular army went in three days after. So so the gang is, I mean, this is from, from his notes. This is the old, yeah, Bulgarides, yes. Bulgarides, who is, uh, uh, um, yeah, okay. Right. Reports of uh, Bulgarides, this ancient consular de France of, in Kavala. The Council of France in Saloniki. Uh, the gang leaders arrested several Muslims, such as police commissioner, captain, etc., etc., as well as all these people numbering, said, it, it is said 51 were sent to the barracks on the edge of the sea outside Kavala and were massacred with bayonets and knives. 
It was the Bulgarian and Armenian bandits arresting and torturing the prominent people. AR quotes from the American Jewish yearbook that the occupation of Kavala in November was attended by robbery of many Jews. This was, of course, in the Jewish yearbook. Seven of the most prominent were carried off by the Bulgarian bandits and released only after they had paid a ransom of $43,000. Also, I've found in, uh, in, uh, in the uh, international press, these two articles that the Iranians started massacring Turkish Muslim civilians, which is rejected in a paper, but explains what the Armenians uh, did with the, with the Bulgarians. Is written a book, Karabet Mumjian, called The Rebels with the Cause Armenian Macedonian Relations and Their Bulgarian Connections, where they work together, uh, as I mentioned previously, to, to conquer Macedonia and form an independent Macedonia, and also building, building bombs, which is explained in the Mumjian's paper. They were building bombs and sent to Armenia in the eastern Anatolia. Anyway, uh, all this led to the uh, my my uh, grandfather and the family uh, to to uh, to leave Kavala, which they did uh, for for which they they did with El Mahlusa, uh, the yacht sent by Yif Abbas II. They left for, for, for Alexandria. By the way, El Mahlusa is interesting, could interest you, if I tell you that the, uh, it was the world's oldest active super yacht, it's still the ninth largest one, with a length of 146 meters. It was built in 1960, uh, 1863 to 65 by uh, Samuda Brothers, it's a British building company, on the order of Hidif Ismail Pasha. Uh, the, the yacht was, it carried three Egyptian rulers to exile, Hidiv Ismail, who ordered the, <laughs> the yacht, Hidiv Abbas II, and Kral Farouk, King Farouk. It's a... This is the Hidiv, when he was young, and then uh, when in 1927, when uh, my grandfather, I will tell about that later on, but uh, my grandfather, uh, they, they, they established formed a, a, a bank together in 1927, when he was in exile in Geneva. Anyway, this is, this is the uh, Mahrusa. It's uh, an impressive boat. And they stayed in, uh, in Rasserti Palace in Alexandria for a couple of years. Then they moved to Istanbul. I don't know about much of the story in, uh, in um, what they did in Alexandria. I was told that they had a cigarette factory there, but I don't have any information. What I have is this picture here of... of the one on the right is my grandfather, and the one on the left is Ibrahim Pasha. It's an interesting picture. Now, uh, after a couple of years, they they uh, they they came back to they came uh, the family settled in Istanbul, continued to work as a tobacco trader in Istanbul. This is their uh, where their office is. Uh, and the younger brother, 
Abbas uh, is in the, they work, they are working together. And this is their office in, in Dresden, in Germany. I found this, uh, this letter and I said, hence the, the address and hence the, uh, the, the, the building. Uh, who became later in 1927, the Council General of Turkey for Dresden. Of course, in the meanwhile, the, uh, the, the World War I is raging and the Ottoman Empire is losing on war on all fronts. Finally, Istanbul was invaded by the Allies in November 18, 1918, and after the ceasefire agreement with Mondros. Uh, Greeks uh, come to uh, land in Izmir in May uh, 1919. So it's war we're raging uh, all around. Other took set foot on uh, in Samson in May 1919 and starts the independence war. So Atatürk needs a, a, a secret organization in Istanbul, the secret organization founded by the COP members, which is called Karakor. But this is mainly to protect the CUP personalities from being hunted down by the Allied powers. But it's also a, a sort of a militia. Atatürk does not want any militia. He, want, he wants a, a secret service. Of course, he uses some of the elements of the Karakol organization, but has his own team to head the service. And he appoints Hussein Bey, my grandfather, uh, as a board member on the what's called the MIM MIM, MM. Uh, this organization were to obtain information, steal and, smuggle, steal and smuggle arms for, from the allied warehouses, smuggle people to Anatolia to join the army there, obtain finances for the independence war and propaganda. I know from my family that Hussein Bey was actively involved in financing and in some of the operations of the Secret Service. An important exchange personality, Kobisa Ismail Hakkı, who was, who has is, is, uh, written uh, a book about his uh, memories, uh, was an MP of the Greek uh, King's Party, Gunaris. Mentions that Hussein Bey uh, has seen uh, Hussein Bey in the Mesaret coffee shop in Sirkeji, which is a place, this one is the Mesaret, which is a place where the uh, the, the spies, the mid spies or, or, or elements were meeting. So we used to go there frequently to uh, probably commute with the uh, with, with the uh, with the other elements. Second is done is uh, in June 1922, he along with the uh, with the, some Turkish business people invested in a publication house called the Iktisadi Tetkikat Neshriyat Muamirat, which is she translated as Economic Investigations, Publications and Treatment Company Incorporated. To secretly gather information under the pretext of preparing a Turkish commercial year called the Turkish Aret Sarnamisi about the presence of the Turkish business community in Istanbul, which was under the occupation of the Allied forces. Three months of intelligence work revealed that in Istanbul, the number of Muslim Turkish elements among those dealing with imports and exports was 4%. 4%. In brokerage did not exceed 3%. There were only a few Turkish banks, no Turkish insurance companies, all utilities, water, electricity, communications, transport, as well as mines and tobacco business were owned and run by prerogative foreign companies. So this is the, the picture they, they have. So intelligence made during the preparation of this uh, Turkish commercial yearbook study revealed the character and share of the Turkish element in the economics of Istanbul during and after the armistice period. 
which looked very grim in view of the upcoming change in the political situation in Turkey, because once the foreign elements left, what, what, I mean, they, you don't have any, uh, anybody take, take their, uh, their place. So which looked grim. Uh, and uh, the, the, the, it required the Turks to become dominant in trade and commerce and make investments which seemed that they were not prepared to accomplish once the, uh, the foreign elements left the country. Thus, Hussein Bey and his friends, let's call it the Muslim Turkish Entrepreneur Group, on its mission to encourage Turks to, make, to, to take major roles in the economy, were looking for an appropriate time and opportunity to take action. This opportunity was one with the peace after the Mudani armistice, Rafet Pasha came to Istanbul with the Turkish army to take over Istanbul from the Allied forces in uh, October 1922. Here we are. This is Rafet Pasha. And this is my grandfather. Uh, my mother used to tell me that Rafet Pasha came to their house for dinner on that day. Anyway, uh, Hussein Bey met with Rabat Pasha later and got Ankara, Ankara government's approval through him to official form what's called the MTTB, National Turkish Commerce Union, which held their first meeting on uh, December the 1st, 1922, and Hussein Bey was elected as the president of the union. This is the gathering of the Turkish Muslim businessmen together. Now, what they did was to, to have, uh, to, to cover the economic void in Istanbul after the, uh, the foreigners left with the Turkish businessmen, they set to organize a foreign trade congress and invite all actors of the economic life uh, and they, they set a date uh, for, for January 15, 1923. It was later had to be postponed because the, uh, because the Ministry of Economy uh, sent a letter uh, asking them to end the Izmir, Izmir Economic Congress, which will be held in February in Izmir. So upon this request, you see him, he makes a speech, uh, collects the, uh, the, the, the, the, the people, the business people, and makes a speech that says that they have to prepare uh, and make suggestions, recommendations, and make motions uh, in the uh, Izmir Economic Congress. So upon this, uh, they, have a two -day, they, they hold two -day, a two-day meeting, and uh, they come up with 12, 12 main topics to be presented to the Economic Congress in Izmir, which was held between February 17th and March 4th, 1923. Uh, I'll go through them because they are important in the, uh, in the newly established Republic. Uh, one is customs protection and customs independence must be unconditional. Two, no monopoly or privileges should be granted to foreign capital, even in partnership with the government. Existing monopolies should be abolished. Three, the right of cabotage in Turkish territorial waters should be granted to the Turkish flag, and no privileges should be granted to an institution or company. Four, a large national bank should be established, and this bank should be a joint stock company whose capital is sold partly to the state and partly to the Turkish public. But then they go on to say that even if the states invest in the bank, should later sell the sell share shares to the public and disengage from the bank. Five, commercial legislation should be renewed. Six, foreign capital should be allowed to enter the country in a way that does not harm the economy. Seven, organization of Chamber of Commerce and Industry should be restructured and nationalized. Eight, formal 
and semi-official government institutions should be established to facilitate foreign trade, that is the establishment of commercial attaches in foreign countries. Nine, income tax relief structure. 10, a committee of experts should be formed to regulate the foreign exchange issue, that is the establishment of national foreign exchange centers and the nationalization of cash and bond exchanges. 11 is the opinion, opinions of Chamber of Commerce and Industry and committees of economists should be sought, should be sought on procedures and taxes related to traders and trade. 12, trade school in Istanbul should be modernized and trade schools should be opened all over the country. All these proposed motions by the NTTB were accepted and uh, at the meetings in the, in the Congress in a much detailed format and later put into action by the Ankara government. They had important beneficial consequences in the newly established Republic. Now I will tell you four of these whom my grandfather was influential in their accomplishments. The first one is the Istanbul Chamber of Commerce, uh, ITO. Upon the decision taken at the Congress to nationalize the Istanbul Chamber of Commerce, elections were held and all Turkish business people were elected to the board. Hussein Bey became the per first, first president of the council on September 1923 to remain as president until elected member of parliament from Istanbul in October 1927. For four, for four years. He was unanimously voted to be awarded with the honorary member of the ITO for his work on extensive reorganization of the chamber, record keeping, which were not done previously. Now, quoting from the Chamber of Commerce publication describing this area, it, this, it said, following the transfer of Istanbul to the National State Administration, and with the election held on September 7th, 1923, Istanbul Trade and Chamber of Commerce and Industry Assembly was reconstituted. The council formed under the presidency of Ibrahim Pashazade de Hussein Husnu has a very important place in the history of our chamber. And it is appropriate to state that an active area has just begun. Thus many works that were neglected during the CUP period have been handled with great energy ever since. This change can be easily obtained from the articles in the Chamber, of Mag Chamber magazine and the minutes kept. In this regard, some consider the date September 7, 1923 as the re-establishment of the Chamber for the second time. Actually, the Chamber was founded in 1882 and had a very, very successful three years under the presidency of Azarian Aristakis Efendi, who was elected as president until his death, 1897. However, the chamber lost its momentum, held few meetings of the board. Most members of the board and the administration were from minorities, every year coming almost to a halt in uh, uh, between uh, 1918 in 1923. My grandfather was also successful in establishing and starting the Commodity Exchange in 1924, which was something that was important and also was in the, act in the administration of the trade schools. Then we have the National Bank in accordance with the proposal uh, proposal of the uh, NTTP, uh, that it initiates the investment for a national bank, which, is, which will be called the Turkey İş Bankası. Celal Bayar will be uh, the, the general manager, the founder of the bank. He finds it difficult to, to he, he, he finds good to convince people to make investments. He finally persuades six business people from, uh, from Bursa and this is my grandfather who has already committed for the investment 
and has given the power of attorney to, to, to, to, to Gerard Bayer. Sorry, this is the, uh, I forgot what this is, this is the Economic Congress. And here we go. This is the, um, this is what I seen in the, in the Kavala uh, Tobacco Museum, which I hadn't seen before. He's the first uh, national uh, Istanbul Chamber of Commerce industry president. Oops. What did I do? The uh, uh, the power of attorney uh, is given to Gerard Bayer to form uh, to, to to to represent him in the formation of the uh, Ishbankas. This is a list of the uh, the first uh, fourteen shareholders of the bank. Each had to pay for seventy one seventy one thousand four hundred twenty liras, total of one million liras. Well, this changed, this later changed to 47, 47 investors with the efforts of Atatürk and the, uh, the bank was officially founded in 1924. So it was one of the first investors in the bank. Then we have the, uh, his activities against monopoly. Uh, the Regi, the Ottoman, the, uh, the talks during the Lausanne talks, the French did not agree to to, uh, to accept the change in the conditions of the Regi agreement. And, uh, and the government did not want to, uh, to, to, to risk it and to continue with the, uh, with the agreement as done by the, with the Ottomans. They did not want to dishonor the agreement. There was a clash between, uh, there were two, two camps. One camp was uh, uh, established uh, a monopoly, a national monopoly, not the regime, but monopoly, after the regime went, or uh, let the uh, private sector do the operation and put the tax bans. I don't know exactly what's called the tax bans on the cigarette tax. So there were there were two two camps. Uh, so there was a lot of uh, campaigning and uh, lobbying. Uh, and my grandfather wrote a book. I mean, he was one of the leaders in the uh, against monopoly camp. And uh, he wrote a book about why it should not be a monopoly. And although the, the, the parliament uh, decided in favor of the tax ban system, the government went on to establish the monopoly, first on a temporary basis, <laughs> and then became permanent in 1930. But he went on to, to fight against monopoly. His points were basically, the state does not have a co commercial logic. Thus should not engage in, in, uh, in, in, in commerce. He was not against foreign investment, but did not want the foreigners getting the hold the control of the raw material, such as tobacco. So these were the two things that he was worried about. And, uh, and if the state got the, the monopoly, it could always go into the regi system. So that's why he was, was always against uh, the monopoly system. Uh, another thing which was discussed and decided in the, in the, in the Congress, in the Israel Congress was the, 
was a, a weekend weekend day. And the Congress decided that Friday would be the weekend day throughout Turkey. And previously, this was not, uh, there was no official weekend day during the Ottoman times. And people would take their day off according to their religion, Muslims on Friday, Jews on Saturday, and Christians on Sunday. Uh, it was probably the right decision at the time. But later, as Turkey integrated with the Western world, Hussein Bey, as a member of parliament, moved in for a law to change the weekend to Sunday. But it was only accepted by, by uh, parliament later on May uh, 1935. And this was it, three or four years after he had, uh, he had moved for the law. Here we have the uh, the newspaper uh, thing weekend. Uh, I don't know what uh, why, but I probably I, I think that due to Shembe's affiliation with the workers' unions, when the Labour Party leader Ramsey MacDonald visited Istanbul before going to Ankara. He came to Hussein Bey and they visited together the Istanbul General Workers Union at the headquarters. And this is a photograph. I don't know if you can see that. That this is my grandfather, and this is this is Ramsey MacDonald here. MacDonald was to become the prime minister in December that year. Uh, uh, is governed with the liberals, and then they would ratify the Treaty of Lausanne as the last signatory of, in, in July 1924. Then we have his involvement in the population exchange. After the Lausanne Treaty, <coughs> the population exchange agreement between Turkey and Greece was signed Shembe was appointed as the head of the Turkish exchange delegation for Kavala and Drama region. And he stayed in Kavala from November 23, just after he was elected as the president of the Istanbul Chamber of Commerce, till June 1924. This is to oversee the orderly dispatch of the Turkish population from the region. He has a law book covering uh, the important issues during the operation, which I will, I'm, I will be publishing shortly, uh, going through it. This is the commission. Uh, this is the, the, the one page from the, from the law book, you see on the lower right hand side. And here's the, uh, the, the Greek delegation, uh, the, the Turkish delegation, my grandfather, and this is the independent uh, delegate. Uh, he was overseeing the accommodation and loading operation of the refugees and their animals and transportable goods, providing their subsistence, safety, and the evaluation of the real estates they were leaving behind. This last issue, the evaluation of the real estates, uh, became one of the uh, big uh, disputes or issues between Turkey and Greece, and could not be resolved fairly for the refugees on both, because the valuation of property could not be done properly due to the rush uh, of getting people out of the countries. And this, this uh, I, I can see going through his notes. I mean, there's, there's not time to, to, to, to make the evaluations properly. Anyway, he was very active in, uh, let me show you about the, some pictures he did during the operations. Uh, this is Kavala, Kuchik Fiklik, this one, and uh, he's there with the, with the arrow here, he's here. <laughs> 
you see that the port overlooking the, uh, the the boarding on the people and this is you see the people were boarding the the, the, the, the ships anyway it was a uh, on both sides it was uh, a really tragic affair uh, you see they had already established uh, a society of Macedonians in 1920 and then the Eastern Macedonia Exchange Society in 1923 upon the Rizon Treaty. Uh, these were all to, to, uh, to and also uh, later he found a, a non-exchange society for those people who left Macedonia before October 18, 1912 is considered as non-exchange and they were subject to very unjust treatments anyway these are all uh, to, to trying to defend the rights of the exchange population and he was against uh, the, the agreement between turkey and greece whereby the ownership of all property on both sides will be transferred to the states and the states would decide what to do with the property he made the last speech in the, uh, in the parliament against the ratification of the agreement, but was still ratified. He was not successful to the detriment of the exchange population. Uh, Senbei was also involved uh, in the CUP movement, that's the Committee of uh, Union and uh, Progress. This is based in Kavala. I don't know the extent of his involvement, but, but later on he was on the board of the Istanbul section of uh, CHF, which then became CHP, today's CHP party. Uh, this was born out of the uh, remnants of the Committee of Union Progress. CHP was officially uh, established in uh, 1923. He was an MP from Istanbul from 1927 after uh, the Istanbul Chamber of 1927 to 1931 and was shown as a CHP candidate from Izmir in 1950 elections, but lost because CHP lost big time. Uh, after founding the Republic, he has participated, foundation of the Republic, the development of education uh, and aviation, and, and uh, was appointed uh, by Atatürk to take part in these TED, Turkey and Cheviete, and also the uh, THK, Turkish Aviation Society. Now, the, uh, his investments, I've already told about his investment in uh, the Turkish, uh, Turk, the, the, the, the, the Turkey Ish Bank, the Turk, Ish, Turkey Ish Bank. He then moved forward to establish an insurance company called Itimad Milli, Turk Rivorta Shirketi, the capital of Salvatio. This was, uh, uh, the equity was shared between Turkish and Bulgarian shareholders. The company was also a shareholder in Anadolu insurance company. And it's still today you have the Anadolu insurance company, which is held by uh, Milli Reassurance. Uh, and then also he was also in the, in, invested in the Gwen insurance company, which is today owned by uh, Gurupama. Anyway, uh, that was the insurance. And then he and his brother Abbas was among the 250 founders in the Akisar Tinjilar Bank, it's the Tobacco Growers Bank in 1924 to support the tobacco farmers. 
was also sitting on the board of directors until uh, 1928. This later became uh, Yashar Bank and uh, then Sugar Bank because of the financial difficulties in 1999. Um, another investment of his was the Bursa Silk Factory. Which opened on uh, August 1929. The, the investors were Japanese, Count of Tony Kozui, which you see here on the left hand side, the upper, upper left hand side. And the Bursa uh, Member of Parliament, MLP. This was equipped with 18 French rooms to produce 5,000 meters per month of crepe de Chine. But during the, during the Great Depression, the tobacco company closed through financial difficulty in 1931 due to delayed payment of 16,000 lires to American Express. The bank takes the issue to the court and the court decides on the bankruptcy of the company. The press is amazed and questions the decision. The, the decision. The same day comes from Ankara, as he's the uh, he's an MP at the time, and declares concordat that pays back the debt. And later starts a new company in partnership with Zirat Bank called the Early Urunert Limited Company, local products company, which in turn invests in another company called Turkey Issues using that's a Sultana company, and he's actively active in both companies as the executive director. Then he moves his home and business to Izmir in 1938 and buys a house in Bornova, uh, probably an ex Levantine house uh, where I was born in 1946. Farm in Menderes, where he grows tobacco and enjoys farming on weekends. CHP puts his, uh, as a candidate from Izmir in 1950, as I told you, but they lose elections. Anyway, he dies, uh, dies in 1960 and is buried in Izmir. He was quite a pleasant gentleman. People respect him and love him. He had very strong beliefs and would pursue them to the end. He was on the same page with Atati regarding the actions for the development of the new nation and was supported as very loyal to Atati. Maybe because he is from the other side of the water, as we call it, and had been an active member of the CUP. This is uh, from his tobacco operations in Izmir with the workers. This is the uh, Bornova house. And this is me. And this is my cousin. Unfortunately passed away. And this is from the farm. This is from the old time where me and my cousin riding horses. <laughs> and this is a new pic picture. Unfortunately, this is all gone into shambles. Thank you very much for listening. And if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer. Well, thank you so much for what really was an absolutely beautiful presentation that gave us such a uh, understanding of a, of a long durée, which um, must have been shattering for the people who lived through it already in a revolutionary period and then to lose their homes repeatedly to move repeatedly what remarkable resilience that generation showed that they were able to build a republic uh, having lived through that um well uh, i'm sure that there will be many questions but just whilst people are thinking of their questions uh, in, in your reading of your father's material 
did you get any sense of where he learnt his superb understanding of economics from? I mean, did he read internationally? Did he, did his family have close trading links with uh, uh, places overseas? Egypt, you've already mentioned, but perhaps with London or with Paris or Berlin, somewhere that gave him this really profound understanding of, um, of international um, uh, trade. I have a message here saying that Mike's gone. I'm sorry about that, but if you can hear me, yes. uh, at least my question, we can sort that no, out. David, uh, David, I think the, uh, the thing is, uh, Kabbalah was in school. This is what I see, because mm. Kabbalah was a very actively uh, a place of, of trade. I mean, and, and he, he started from uh, grassroots. I mean, he started from growing tobacco. I mean, he was, he was passionately in love with, uh, with agriculture. I mean, he loved, that's why he bought the land in the, the, the, the farm in Izmir. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, okay, I mean, he was growing tobacco, but not tobacco, but he wanted to, to deal with land. I mean, he, he loved to, to grow tobacco. He loved tobacco. And of course, he understood tobacco, and uh, and then to build on that uh, with the with all the foreign companies working there, I think it's a big school. Mm. I think mm. it's a big school. I mean, uh, I, I don't. I mean, he, I, I don't think he's he's uh, he's not uh, he's educated at home. Mm. He's not he's not gone to university. No. no. Mm. No, no, it's mm -hmm. remarkable because he he showed such a varied interest in his times. I mean, in, in, in con the condition of the workers, in the way that you need capital to run a business, in the practical ideas of setting up um, uh, production of uh, primary things of primary concern, such as su such as tobacco, but other things as well, obviously, through the formation of a bank. He must have been a remarkably intelligent and sympathetic man to think of these these problems. Uh, so systematically, I, I suppose that would imply to me, someone who's hearing about this for the first time, that he must have had a group of friends with whom he could talk about these problems. And therefore, maybe his CUP membership really was very significant indeed in this earlier period that helped him systemize his thoughts. Yeah. Mm. That would be my logical conclusion yeah, from that. I, but yeah, mm. I think the... Um... What I was telling you about Kavala exploding into a, you know from a, a, a small town or even a, a big village maybe becoming a, a, a you know like a Western commercial town with all mm -hmm. the uh, foreign people coming in and uh, so you have all this networking so all this information going around of course it's a, a small place uh, it's not like New York <laughs> it's, a, it's a small place so everything is crammed together. And you meet all these people who come from uh, from uh, from Austria, from Hungary, from from England, from America. Yeah. They're all there, uh, and you have the you know the, the, the club there. You have the so I think there's a lot of uh, you know opportunities to learn if you're open-minded. Yeah, yeah, I that's basically what it is. Yeah, uh, three fascinating. And, and how did he? How did he sustain himself financially? Because he doesn't appear to have gone bankrupt. So it must mean that he was able to convert his money into something that was you know, usable somewhere. Um, I, I know that the, from, the, from this uh, exchange documentation that <clears throat> because in, uh, after 1912, there's another agreement between uh, Greece and Turkey that the uh, people in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the eastern Thrace, in the, you know, in the southern Macedonia, the, the Turks, Muslim Turks living there, and the, uh, the Greeks living in, in Istanbul were not to be touched. And the, the, the, the states would preserve their incomes, their you know, well-beings, etc. So what they did was they they were renting renting these places out, these these uh, warehouses, hmm. and of course uh, 
they got some money in, the, in exchange uh, from the Turkish state, in exchange for what they had over there. Not one-to-one. -one. Nobody, not the Greeks, not the Turks, they did, they did not get one-to-one. -one. Mm. As I said, you know, they, they, there's, they, there was an unjust distribution of the, uh, of the wealth. I mean, uh, all these big houses, uh, the warehouses uh, that the, my, my family left there, I don't know one Greek person that, that, that owns them. There were rich Greek people living in, in uh, Asia. The state got them. I mean, the state or the military or the national bank, they got them. Mm. Yes, yes. And, and, and um, have you any sense as to how close he was to Ataturk? Uh, I think pretty close. But but he's not. I mean, uh, as I said, you know, he's not. Uh, I don't have <laughs> because Atatürk has Ishpankasa is one of the uh, together with Atatürk one of the first founders. He's uh, he's uh, Atatürk appoints him to the secret organization. Atatürk appoints him to the uh, to the. Uh, Educational board, Atatürk appoints him to the aviation board. I mean, these are, I mean, Atatürk, they should be close. They should be close, at least in in, in thinking, maybe not, uh, because Atatürk is in Ankara and he's in Istanbul. Exactly. So Atatürk didn't bring him to Ankara, but maybe he needed him to be in Istanbul to carry on reporting. Yes, there's a point about that, because in, uh, in a, there was uh, a movement that, he would become an MP in 1923, but he said, "You know, I have to stay in Istanbul to complete my my my uh, agenda here with the with the trade with the trade thing, you know, with the Istanbul mm -hmm. Chamber of Commerce, bringing together the uh, the Turkish people into business mm -hmm. because there's this huge vacuum, you know. It's uh, I mean, all the foreigners were going out, the minorities going out." Uh, the Greeks going out, everybody's going out, and all this, this business that was, uh, because the business, they, they, they were the, the business people. So there was this big, big void uh, that was expected. Yeah, that's also a fascinating point. But, but um, uh, please, colleagues, I, I will log in and log out again to get my camera back. Um, but um, and please, perhaps the next person will ask a question whilst I disappear for a uh, a moment. I've got one picture of it with, with Atatürk. <laughs> mm -hmm. Who would like to, I'm back now, I hope I have a camera. Who, who would like to ask a question? I don't know how this fits in with um, your experience, Peter, and your your your your um, understandings of the developments of the Republic uh, and your conversations with um, with um, various people of your in-laws whom you must have met at the time. Is it is it fairly congruent? We seem to have lost Peter. No, we can't see people's faces. I wonder if we could get rid of oh, the share. Yes, no, oh, yeah, that's better. I can talk. Um, no, Mughal didn't talk about the economic activities of her grandfather a great deal. Um, you were asking earlier about uh, economic training. Um, 
of Hussein Bey, but um, when Hassan Bey was, was appointed finance minister, Ataturk had stipulated that he wanted somebody who wasn't an economist to be his finance minister, um, having had bad experience with the first one he'd had. Hmm. Yes, maybe there was a sense that they needed people on the with practical experience. Then, well, yes, I think it's, he, he respected common sense more than academic expertise, perhaps. Hmm. That seems very sensible. But in any case, he was extremely successful and managed to fill an absolutely empty treasury and pay the army at both ends of Anatolia. Yes, yes, yes. I'm thinking that, that, that, that they may even have been acquainted, you know. Um, well, I, I was thinking that I think in the last photograph we saw, he was on the left with a small moustache. Yes, that one, I think that, that may be Hassan Bey. Mm -hmm. We will always emphasize that he was very tall. Mm. And where is Hussein Bey in this one? Yeah. Ah. Mm. Mm. And what year was that taken? Uh, I have no idea. No, this is this is again one one of the uh, photographs that was. Uh, <coughs> With the family. I'll show you these. Mm. <laughs> this is one of the, I mean, not, not of course when he was seven years old because this is the Browning. I think it came out later on. This is his car, one of his cars. I mean, not his car, but I know that it's uh, Mercedes 1924. And this is the, uh, he got the Romanian uh, Industrial Merit Medal. And this is the uh, Monopoly 50th year souvenir cigarettes of Hussein. They, they wrote it wrong, it's not Kavala, it's Kavala L. Uh, mm -hmm. Anyway, it says, you know, for the... Uh, So the the the the um, Ipec Fabrica suit uh, did that then uh, become part of the the the Sumer Bank holdings? Uh, no, no. <clears throat> what happened with the Ipec Bank? Uh, I mean, there was uh, a clash between. I mean the. The Japanese and Memnupe, who was running the business, and my grandfather was not involved in running the business, he was an investor. Mm -hmm. uh, they had a clash, a cultural difference of running. <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> the Japanese left, and it was my grandfather and uh, Memnupe. But later, when uh, my grandfather's situation, financial situation, went, went uh, sour, uh, he, he he sold the shares to Ishpankas, or he delivered the shares to Ishpankas. Mm. Well, he was out of the uh, and the silk factory, as far as I know, went until nineteen uh, early fifties, and then closed mm. down. Oh, okay, okay. Mm. I mean, the other really fascinating thing you talked about was the extent to which the Ottomans simply were not businessmen for the most part. Of course, mm -hmm. many people have, have written yeah. that, but it is really quite extraordinary. Yeah. Three to four <laughs> percent. Yeah. It wasn't only the capitulations, of course, um, but, but it just seems to have been the general way that they constructed their society, that they would be civil servants and Soldiers, of course, and uh, and governors. Yeah. 
Well, remember that at the beginning of the Ottoman Empire, after the conquest of Constantinople, um, Fatih Sultan Mehmet brought in Jews from Spain yeah. in order to set up a network across uh, Anatolia and, and Thrace, presumably. Um, so it's not surprising that they, they remain dominant, plus the Armenians. Well, uh, and the Greeks, of course, yeah. Yes. And, and, and, and then the, and then the uh, individual trading nations, uh, they set up their various places. Uh, quite remarkable. I mean, here I find the work of Aisha Bura really convincing when she writes that the idea was that the Ottoman state would make sure it kept with changing the rules where necessary and later on the public the Republican one as well um, and that was the way that they would keep the businessmen and the private business under control mm. Mm. You know, so, so, so that the regulations change so frequently that they can never relax <laughs> the interesting is on both sides I mean in uh, for instance in these uh, uh, law book, uh, I'll call it the law book that he, he held during the uh, exchange period in Kavala. Uh, he writes there that a lot of uh, uh, writings on the walls uh, saying that if you go to Anatolia, to the Turks, to the Muslims, you will be prosecuted. Don't go. You will be prosecuted because you're drinking or you're doing this, so don't go. <laughs> there was an anti, uh, uh, let's say, propaganda, so that the people, because the, the Turks there knew what to do. And the same thing happened here uh, when the Greeks were leaving town or leaving the villages. The Turks or the Turks Muslims, you know, if if uh, Yorgo goes, how are they going to do this? How are, we don't know trade. I mean, he's he's the, uh, he's the market uh, owner there, and if he goes, you know, how are we going to operate the market? We don't know. So they on both sides. They were uh, they wanted to keep the same uh, habits going on. Exactly. So one would get people coming from Greece and given farmland, and they had no idea how to use it or. To, to, they had no idea how to be peasants because they'd never been peasants until they got to Turkey. How uh, is your biography progressing? Well, I've now concentrated on this uh, uh, Asia Commission thing because there's a lot of uh, newspapers that I have to go through uh, about the exchange situation and uh, his talks and his works in the uh, in the um, I had it uh, modernized I mean it's it's all written in uh, you know, Arabic letters in the Ottoman script that's done uh, so I think in, in two or three months I will publish that and then go on to the uh, to the uh, autobiography, or biography. Okay. Yeah, I think it will be a very important book. Uh, are there any letters? Did he write letters at all? No, he used to write me letters, funny letters, <laughs> <laughs> <laughs> with, uh, with stories and jokes addressed to me. Uh, mm. I don't know, prob probably he would. And, uh, and, and did, in his private life, uh, uh, presumably, of course he was married, um, yeah. But did he, did he, when he went into exile and so on, was he able to bring his family with him or did they have to wait for him and he'd send for them later? How did that work? No, they, they moved together. They moved mm. together. Yeah. Well, they were lucky in that case that they were able to do that. A couple yes. of years in Alexandria and then to, to Istanbul. Uh, they stayed, I think, two years in, in uh, Alexandria. Mm. Mm. Mm. And, and um, the connection between Egypt and Turkey at that time, that's an area that I'm not strong in, in my historical understanding. Uh, could you just correct us as to why he went to Egypt? Well, of course, uh, uh, 
Kavala and, and Egypt, because Mehmet Ali uh, Pasha is from, from Kavala. Mm. And he's yeah, I mean he's the he's the governor there, which later becomes the uh, the the I mean the family becomes the king or the you know the, the, uh, they are the ruling family of of, of of Egypt. So there's a connection between uh, Kavala and and, and and Egypt. Direct yep. connection. Of course, of course, of course that that that, that explains it. Yes, a remarkably important town, obviously. I think you're stimulating us to, to, to go there. So that's why, uh, <clears throat> first thing, I mean, this Mahrusa, it's a, it's a magnificent vessel. I mean, he, he sends it over to, to pick up the uh, people from Kavala because of the, uh, the Bulgarian invasion mm -hmm. and then bring them over to, to, uh, to Alexandria. And later on, I, I think I skipped that, but later on in 1927, uh, uh, Abbas Ilmi II, who's in exile in Geneva, and my grandfather, uh, they, uh, they form a, a bank, they, they establish another bank. Hmm. So there's there's a relation between also the uh, Hidi and uh, my grandfather or the family. Mm. Yes, yes, re re really remarkable. I think it'll be a, a terribly valuable book when it's published. Any more uh, comments from from colleagues or thoughts about this? Well, I think in that case, we just uh, remains for us to thank our speaker uh, for a talk of the most extraordinary interest. And uh, obviously, we look forward greatly to the book when it should it should come out. Thank you for listening. I'm not I'm not a good lecturer, so I I hope that I didn't bore you. <laughs> On the contrary, it was, a, it was an excellent lecture. Th th thank you, thank you, thank you very much indeed. Um, no, no, it was completely clear, beautifully illustrated. It was a perfect picture. So it was fascinating. Thank you very much. Thank you so Thank much. You. Most interesting. And we look forward to meeting on the next occasion. And we'll say for now, well, we'll say we'll say good evening. And thank you very much. Right. Good thank evening. you. Goodbye.